In a world filled with expensive, high-resolution cameras, why are so many photographers these days choosing to buy bargain basement cameras from the early 2000s like this Canon PowerShot G5, which I managed to pick up for about $50? Well, although there are certainly multiple reasons why somebody would buy a camera like this, which we'll obviously talk about in this video, more often than not, the answer comes back to just one thing the sensor. You see, older compact cameras like this don't typically use the same kind of CMOS sensor that are commonplace in digital cameras today. Instead, they use a now largely defunct type of sensor known as a CCD. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to go into the technical breakdown on the differences between CCD and CMOS sensors, because quite frankly, I am not qualified to do that and it might bore the pants off you. So the crux of it is that CCDs were largely phased out because CMOS sensors were cheaper, faster and more energy efficient. And ultimately, that means that they are much better at capturing video and focusing photos at higher frames per second and in turn that means they're much better suited to the needs of photographers and videographers today. So if we're saying that CCD digicams like this are now very much outdated, why would you ever consider buying one? Well I guess you could ask the same question of film photographers because you could argue that film photography is even more outdated than this so therefore why bother? And I'm pretty sure they'd give you the same answer which is it's just fun and it offers nostalgia value and the images have a very unique look to them that isn't easily replicated by modern digital cameras. Now, if you happen to grow up in the late 90s or early 2000s like I did, then cameras like this will probably unlock some core memories when your parents, friends or relatives use something like this to capture important moments in your childhood. And I know the term film-like photos is something that's thrown around quite a lot these days, but this camera in particular does do a really good job of creating that pleasing, soft and retro appearance that gives photos the kind of look that your childhood photos had. And for me at least, that generates a huge amount of enjoyment and happiness when shooting with it, which fundamentally I think is the same reason why other photographers are now getting drawn back into using this old technology. Plus cameras like this are just so cheap to buy at the moment so there's very little risk involved in getting one because even if you only bust it out once a year for a bit of fun for a couple of bucks at the very least it's a fun little photographic toy you can play around with now and again and I imagine that as these start to get snapped up the price will only rise with the demand so assuming you are intrigued by buying one of these cameras then there is a lot of sense in buying one now before they become harder to buy and therefore more expensive. But aside from being a fun tool to use, I do believe that there are actually some real world benefits to using a camera like this, which can actually help to improve your core skills as a photographer. After shooting some street photography with this G5, I have noticed that there are a number of shared traits between this and shooting with my film cameras, just with a few added benefits. In a previous video, which I'll link up here somewhere if you're interested, I have talked about my recent struggles with trying to find ways of making photography something I do for fun rather than just something I do to make a living and as part of that journey for a while at least I tried my hand at some film photography. Now there are a number of aspects to shooting with film that I really do love and one thing is that it forces you just to slow down and really think about the shot that you're capturing and how you're going to capture it. With modern digital cameras they're just so quick and capable and oftentimes a lot of the challenge is taken away from you as the photographer. In the case of this G5 when the camera needs at least a few seconds to write the faster card after every second or third shot spraying and praying is no longer a viable strategy so timing your shot is crucial to success and when you do get it right believe me it is way more rewarding. One of the key benefits that this camera has over my film camera is that not only does it shoot an infinite amount of images which means no more shelling out for film or having to pay to get it developed afterwards but you can also capture images in RAW. <laughs> Not only does it mean that the photos you capture with this are just that little bit more forgiving because you could correct them in post-production, but also you have the flexibility to add your own color grades to them to get that retro film-like aesthetic if that's what you're trying to capture. Though if you're really not into editing and you just want to shoot JPEG straight out of the camera for that early 2000s look, then you can obviously do that and just skip the post-processing entirely. So with literally hundreds of CCD cameras to choose from, why did I buy this camera specifically? Well, the Canon PowerShot range of cameras started all the way back in 19. 96, with the professional G series starting with the G1 in the year 2000. Now, despite this being called the G5, this is actually the fourth camera in the lineup because Japanese manufacturers tend to avoid using the number four in their product naming because it's considered bad luck. PowerShot G cameras are still going strong today in various forms and they have continued to sell so well mainly because Canon generally do a pretty good job of cramming them full of high-end features. One of the things I like most about these types of compacts is that generally they have a pretty good built-in 
and zoom lens. This camera in particular is no exception to that and offers a 7.2 to 28.8 millimeter focal length with a fast variable maximum aperture of f2 to 3. Now this roughly equates to something like a 35 to 140 millimeter in full frame terms so it's actually a very versatile lens that's useful in a whole bunch of scenarios. So one of my favorite things about this camera has to be that it has a built-in ND filter and I genuinely wish more cameras would include something like this because it just means you can really quickly and easily experiment with slow shutter speeds without the need to buy or attach screw on filters and for street photography in particular this kind of effect tends to work really well. Now you may have spotted that above the zoom on this camera they've actually included a tunnel style viewfinder and this actually zooms in and out with the lens so it gives you a more accurate prediction of what the final image is going to look like. Though I'll be honest and say personally I have never once used this viewfinder because I just find it way easier to use the small flip out screen because it's similar to what I'm used to using on a day-to-day -day basis plus you get to see way more shooting information and it makes it much easier to shoot at lower angles. Though if you're more hardcore than me and you want to stick true to the retro way of shooting you could always just flip the screen away entirely and then use this small LCD top display to view and alter your exposure settings. Now one of the issues you can run into when buying older cameras like this which isn't immediately obvious is just finding batteries for it that still work. This isn't a problem for this camera because it actually uses the same type of battery that Canon used for a number of their earlier DSLRs which means there are plenty of home brand and third-party batteries still in circulation. Although I said earlier that CMOS sensors are generally much better at capturing video that's not to say that CCDs weren't able to capture video at all and in fact this little camera does have a dedicated video capture mode. Now before I tell you just pause the video and take a wild guess at what you think the video specs are for this camera by letting me know in the comments section and no cheating because baby Jesus is watching you all right. Okay brace yourself because this thing can capture video at a staggering 320 by 240 pixels at 15 frames per second capped at three minutes. Yeah, wow. So now you have that information, just try and imagine in your mind's eye just what that would look like. Because honestly, when I heard those specs, I really did struggle to visualize just what that would look like. But to demonstrate the point, in a moment, I am going to swap between the camera I'm filming with right now, which is the Sony A7 Mark III, and I'm going to switch to the PowerShot G5. And it might be a little hard to spot when I switch between these two cameras. In fact, I've done it now, <laughs> sneaky devil. I bet you didn't even notice. Don't don't worry if you didn't, because it's actually quite hard to spot unless you have, you know, experienced experienced eyes like me. Obviously, buying a camera of this age, you are going to stumble into a few downsides. And we've already spoken a little bit about the just general slow speed, which is going to be a given. But one limiting factor that I didn't consider is the ISO range, because this thing can go from 50 to 400. And to add to that, shooting at anything above ISO 100 will add a generous amount of noise to your photos. However, I should add that I find that the grain that it creates is kind of unlike the noise that we're used to seeing on modern cameras. And actually, it's really not bad to look at at all. Not to harp on about it but it does kind of look reminiscent of film grain and if you prefer to shoot with JPEG straight out of the camera I could definitely see this being used as more of a stylistic choice rather than an exposure setting. Now the other limiting factor is the megapixel count or you know the severe lack of because this camera captures five megapixel images and although that is still plenty large enough for posting online or even creating small modest prints the issue really comes when you want to crop in on your photos in post-production because anything other than a little bit of trimming around the edges really isn't feasible without transforming the image into a tiny patch of pixelated mush. Now personally I actually really like this limitation because it once again forces me to be more conscious about my compositions and try to get it right in camera rather than being too reliant on fixing things afterwards in post-production.